welcome to Functional Fertility, the podcast designed to demystify your hormones, up-level your lifestyle, and supercharge your fertility potential. I'm your host, Dr. Kalia Waddles, and today we're covering two topics that I find all the time in my inbox. We're talking about transitioning off of birth control and preparing our bodies for a happy and healthy postpartum experience. Joining me today is my friend, Kristen DeAngelis, a functional dietitian, board certified functional practitioner, health coach, and the director of health coaching at Nutrition Dynamic. Specializing in women's health and fertility, Kristen offers individualized services through her functional trying to conceive courses and period health programs at Nutrition Dynamic. We're so fortunate to have her with us today. Welcome to the show, Kristen. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> We found each other earlier this year at a conference and instantly we bonded over this love for talking about fertility. And then since then, you've become a new mama, which is so exciting. So we have all kinds of things to talk about. And I'm just so happy that we're finally connecting. I know it's all coming full circle. It's 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 amazing. It's all coming full circle. And when we were planning about what we wanted to talk about today, I know that you get tons of questions too about when do I discontinue my birth control and I want to get pregnant? Maybe I've been on birth control for 15 years. So many of us are on birth control for years and years. So the first step is getting off birth control. And then we are trying to figure out what our period is going to look like after that. So I thought we would just start out with that question. Uh, how do you set these expectations with your clients when they say, okay, I'm ready to discontinue my birth control pill. What should I expect? Exactly. This is such a common question. And I think to, to start off this conversation is so many of us are, let's say we are preparing to maybe get married. We want to start family planning after. And we think that just a flip of a switch, we'll be able to take out that birth control and conceive immediately after. And I always have to kind of pause and say, okay, first, let's really discuss how we can prepare your body when wanting to come off birth control pill and prepare for uh, family planning. So this actually stemmed from my own journey, which I hear a lot in the practice, where we come off our birth control pill and we actually don't get our period back. And that's a common question, right? When can I expect that my period will come back. And typically we would want to expect, you know, three months, but within that three to six month time frame, if we're either not getting our period back, or let's say you are getting your period back and it's coming with a whole host of symptoms, maybe you're experiencing heavy bleeding. Um, you are having irregular cycles. You're having migraines, vertigo, depression, anxiety. A lot of this can stem from either the hormonal birth control masking those symptoms. Maybe that's why you went on a, a contraceptive to begin with. Um, or maybe it was actually developed because of the birth control, because of certain nutrient depletions or, you know, what actually happened uh, under the hood, if, if you will. And so when we think of the birth, uh, hormonal birth control, what's actually happening is it's suppressing our natural hormones, rhythms and production. It's basically shutting down the conversation between the brain and the ovaries. And so you know, it's no wonder that when we try to turn on that conversation, things can go awry, not only in our reproductive system, but also in the adrenal system, thyroid system, its impact on the gut microbiome, on the immune system. So when we're wanting to back to the conversation of prepare the body to come off birth control and start trying to conceive, there's so much we can do in the steps before to ensure that you have a really um, a really good experience coming off and, 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 and we kind of are set up in the most successful space possible. I think this is a really good point that you brought up that oftentimes we go on birth control because we have irregular cycles or acne or a whole host of symptoms that then the birth control maybe masks that for some time you come off, you're back to your old patterns. And then it's like, well, shoot, now I have to go looking for the root cause of what really brought me here. And that's where we can step in and offer some support and guidance. So, okay, you're working with your client. They're ready to discontinue the birth control. You want to prepare them. Talk to us about what, what can we do nutritionally? You mentioned that maybe there's some nutrient depletion that happens and we might want to be aware of those. What's kind of step one in building up a, a resiliency for when you discontinue. Absolutely. So I always, if, if you fall into this bucket, I'm really recommending at least one to three months to do the prep work before you actually discontinue your birth control. That's so I'm looking at things in the case, in the buckets of food and nutrition, 
what we can do with our stress and adrenal system. Um, and then also with any other symptoms that we're looking at in regards to like thyroid or other lifestyle aspects, what's going on with exercise over exercise. So we'll start with the foundation of nutrition. So one is addressing, yes, if there's any nutrient depletions, the more that we can improve those nutrient depletions before coming off, uh, the less likely for kind of that swing back of any type of uh, symptoms that we would not want to experience post. So research shows that hormonal birth control can impact our uh, nutrient status. And so important nutrient depletions that we want to consider are things like folate, magnesium, vitamin B12, vitamin B6, B2, selenium, zinc, and antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, and even our um, CoQ10. So when we look at all of these nutrients, I'm thinking from a functional aspect, okay, B12, magnesium, folate, very important for liver detoxification, methylation. We know how important, you know, improving our methylation cycle will help improve our ability to detoxify excess hormones that build up in the body. So how do we, you know, prevent that, that big swing when we start to turn things back on? Well, improving our methylation cycle, that's our phase two estrogen detoxification. When I'm looking at the nutrients as far as selenium, zinc, I'm looking at, hey, how is thyroid being impacted here? Do we wanna make sure that we're uh, looking at some lab work, looking at our thyroid health, but also again, from a nutritional standpoint, um, food, and, food and supplementation targeting in that area. And then additionally, uh, as far as the nutrients of vitamin C, vitamin E, CoQ10, you know, utilizing, uh, of course, a antioxidant rich diet. But again, there can be certain supplementation that those nutrients um, are not only involved in our egg quality, but they're also heavily involved in our thyroid health, they're involved in our adrenal health. And so it's back to that functional model, how can we address um, improving the adrenal, the thyroid, the uh, ovarian health before coming off birth control. So yeah, the food and nutrient uh, repletion is one aspect that we're looking at. Um, I'm typically recommending people to pull back on any type of like over exercise that they may be engaged in for someone who is on birth control. And right now they're at Orange Theory five times a week and they're doing spin on the weekends and they're just really pushing their body. Um, I'm actually recommending to scale back on the intensity of exercise, roughly 30 to 50% and adding more LIS activity, LIS, L-I-S-S, -S, is low intensity, steady state exercise. So adding in a 30 minute walk every day outside, getting that vitamin D, sun on our skin, but walking outside, I always say it's less about the steps and it's more about grounding and feeling, I loved a, a recent episode you talked about was forest bathing. If we can get outside, if we can be in nature, what that can do to our nervous system. So we're trying to really calm and support the nervous system. We're additionally, and again, I'm just kind of going down this checklist yeah, that we want to okay. think about, <laughs> um, blood sugar balance. Um, I'm always recommending people to start to check their blood sugars when we work together so that we can make sure we are improving and, and, and reducing any type of inflammation that's coming in from a dysglycemic uh, response that the body might be having. So uh, typically with a nutrition protocol, we're doing more of a Mediterranean style diet that's going to uh, compose mostly about 20 to 25% protein. 40 to 50 percent carbohydrate and the remainder of, of healthy fats. So again, kind of like the food bucket, replete nutrients, address blood sugars, reduce excess stress, um, and and address also the systems as far as you know adrenal health, thyroid health, and we can utilize labs before coming off birth control to really know where we're at, and then of course doing laboratory. Uh, usually, I like to do that about two to three months post coming off birth control. You anticipated my next question for you. You are new. Okay, there's so much to unpack here. And I shout out to the low intensity steady state because I personally love how this has been rebranded for many of us as the hot mom walk. Yes. And I say start your hot mom walk like in the preconception time frame because you're going to need it. It's going to help you to remain calm, cool, and collected. So big, big um, fan of the low intensity steady state exercising in terms of nutrient repletion, people always ask me, when should I start a prenatal vitamin? And this is exactly why I say start way before you're ready to, to try mm -hmm. to conceive, because oftentimes the prenatal vitamins that we're going to recommend, they have, you know, the available sources of B vitamins, the antioxidant blends, zinc, selenium, vitamin C, and oftentimes kind of like egg quality support supplements will have the CoQ10 and the 
um, you know, more high dose antioxidants. So let's just bring them on now. Right. Absolutely. It's never, never too early to start supporting your uh, conception journey. So yeah, the earlier, the better. If you're, if you're just getting into this though, I would say a minimum of three months. Minimum of three months. That's my philosophy too, because we know that that journey from a very small, immature follicle or egg cell to an egg cell that is large enough to be ovulated takes about three months. So let's optimize the whole maturation journey of that little egg cell and make sure there's nutrient repletion, low toxicity, everything that you mentioned. So you talked about labs uh, and that timeline of of doing labs. Sometimes uh, patients will come to me and they'll say, you know, I went to my primary care doc and they said, I'm on birth control. And so they just didn't think that it was like useful at all to do any labs right now. I'd love to hear your response and how you handle that situation because I'm sure it comes up in your practice too. Yeah, I think what's challenging here is that we're we're often under undereducated with actually what questions to ask, right? And yeah. so utilizing this podcast, utilizing utilizing you know resources to know what are the questions that I do need to ask, and one of them is, hey, can I get a vitamin D, a full thyroid panel, not just a TSH, but I want to get TSH, free T3, free T4, and then I want to look at my micronutrient status, and they might you know again say, well, that doesn't really you know, we don't typically run that. That's okay. I would say I'm the paying patient. I, I really am advocating for my health. And this is something that um, I do want to move forward on. And again, the beautiful thing is that if you continue to feel, I, I understand kind of that white coat syndrome, and we can feel a little bit nervous, you can always order your own labs and work with a practitioner, even just to interpret those labs with you. I think where we've, you know, one of the pieces of where we've failed in the conventional medical model is we may have our labs run and no one ever goes over with over them with us, especially for more of that functional and optimal range. You know, a TSH might be at a four and no one says anything to us. And we don't know if there is an issue with that. But to me, as a functional practitioner, that's really saying, okay, we've got some suboptimal um, hypothyroidism. How can we support you with that? What are some other avenues that we want to look into? So always knowing that you you can order labs um, and, and get them interpreted by you know, a functional practitioner. Um, but that would be, you know, my recommendation kind of going in and kind of asking for the, for the follow-up with your current primary care. Yeah. Super good advice. And again, I'll just put another plug in for functional practitioners who can work collaboratively with your primary care or with your specialist, because I ultimately, we all benefit when we work together and have a really strong collaborative care team. So if you need more information, there are practitioners out there who are willing and able and excited to give that to you. Absolutely. I think that all of us now, and this was actually something we were talking about the symposium. I remember when I first met you is how can we create more of this uh, complementary model where we're all working together as a team, where all systems are talking together. And again, I know for yourself or myself in our practices, it's like, Hey, if you're working with your primary care, have them give me a call if they want me to talk about, you know, why we, we are recommending some of these tests, right? Let's open up the conversation rather than uh, siloing in one section or the other. Mm -hmm. Yep. We all win when we work together. So in terms of where patients get their information, they obviously are probably talking to a few different practitioners. And a question that I get all the time is, I'm so confused about whether or not my birth control is going to make it more difficult for me to conceive. Like, did I set myself up? And there's often uh, fear or maybe even guilt. So uh, this is a listener question. Someone wrote in and said, please talk about this. Will you <laughs> let us know how you respond to this question in practice? Yeah. So the first thing is just having compassion for that person, it's telling them, oh. you know, you didn't do anything wrong. You did what you thought was best at the time. And you know what, maybe that was the best choice to do at the time. And so now it's really a matter of how can we help support you as you move forward and coming up birth control is going to be different for everyone, right? It, it's really looking at an assessment of, are there any underlying conditions? Is there PCOS that's been misdiagnosed, right? 50% of women with PCOS don't even know that they have it. So how can we help to, you know, lead down that path? Are there, again, um, any other issues that need to be addressed? Is there, you know, overweight or, um, you know, other aspects with health status that we need to address? All of that can kind of impact our ability with trying to conceive whether you're on hormonal birth control or not. So I always stress like, don't, don't overly worry about what you did or didn't do. Take action with where you're at now and the steps that you can do moving forward, which is the most empowering part of this work. 
Ooh, I love that. That's super approachable. And I'll just add to that that um, I'm in a I'm in a book club with some other docs, and right now we're reading the book "Think Like a Monk" by Jay Shetty. And I love. I've read it twice. It's one you've of read my it favorites. twice. Yeah, it's so good. So you'll know this part where he talks about focusing on what is rather than what if. And I think this is perfectly relevant in this situation. I have shared that I tend to be a bit of a, I call it a chronic catastrophizer. Like I'm a worry wart. I kind of, you know, can uh, try to anticipate worst case scenario. And oftentimes that's what we do when we come off birth control. We're like, I've totally messed up my hormones. I'm going to have such a hard time getting pregnant. But what you said is focus on what is, which is you're taking control. You are focusing on your nutrients. You're getting your labs. You're being proactive. You're doing everything you can. So -hmm. let's focus on what is right now is you're taking care of yourself and you're going to be fertile. Absolutely. And you're ahead of the curve if you're already listening to this or you're doing the work of getting yourself educated. And that's what's important. To your point, this is so common. We can really harp on you know what we did or something in the past. I, it was the same thing for me. That was part of my story. I had amenorrhea for over seven years, loss of period. I experienced post-pill birth control um, syndrome. And that actually turned me into where I'm at now, right? We call it pain to prosperity. What was the pain that I went to into the uh, empowering journey? And not only what I you know, can do and help support for myself, but how I can also share this information with others. If you're listening to this, if you're going through this journey, there's so many women that are you know, in our own isolated spaces and, 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 uh, and, and feeling alone. But the thing is, we're not alone. And so starting to just open up that conversation of, okay, what is, what can I do? And let me also like share what I'm learning with other women too. Beautiful. Community is so healing. And we need along this whole journey, when you're planning for pregnancy, when you are pregnant, when you're postpartum, the community is everything. And having, I think for me, especially having women in my life who served as such a consistent source of encouragement and strength and support has been incredibly beneficial. And you just, you just went through this because you just had a baby. (laughs) Yes. Oh my gosh. It's been, again, back to talking about full circle. Uh, It's the amount of women that I've worked with and helping try to conceive and going through pregnancy and postpartum, but now being able to really speak to it personally. Um, I'm someone that, again, I I have so much compassion as it is, but I, I really feel like I can see the world from a new set of eyes and, and also sharing like, what would I want Mm-hmm. someone to know before they conceive and how to support them during and also in the postpartum phase because it's a lot and even as much as you prepare you never really yeah understand until that you know next step absolutely well let's let's dive in here a little bit because i would love to learn about some of the most important steps that you took in your preconception time frame that now in reflection you feel like really set you up for some resiliency and success after your baby was born. Yes, absolutely. So first off, you know, we'll talk about the the nutrition aspect, right? As a dietitian, obviously that's the wheelhouse that I'm in. And so um, really honing in on each um, phase, each trimester, and also preconception from a nutrient status, making sure that I was in a really helpful space. I like to say, you know, making quote space for baby, not only in our Um, emotional life in our physical life? You know, am I someone that's always go, 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 but nutritionally, is this a space of plenty or am am, am I in a space of famine? I have a lot of women that come in and they want to diet and lose weight and they want to conceive at the same time. And we really need to identify what's our number one goal and priority Um, It doesn't mean that we can't get down inflammation, um, but I really think that it's important to focus on what is the goal here and how can we ensure we're supporting from a, a really uh, good nutrient rich space. So throughout each trimester, we're looking at specific nutrients. Um, some big ones that we've already kind of brought up are B vitamin family, our methylation family. Um, choline is a big one. You know, 90% of Americans don't meet our choline needs and they actually double when we are in, uh, in pregnancy. Same thing with iron. Iron needs double during pregnancy. So that's a big thing that I truly believe help can set you up not only for healthy and research and data shows this setting you up for healthy maternal and fetal outcomes, but also in the postpartum phase as well. Right. So when we're looking at even things like essential fatty acids and DHA, uh, mothers who consumed uh, DHA 
an adequate amount during pregnancy. When we look at the long-term studies, even seven years later, the child, the offspring, uh, the IQ actually increased, right? So the things that it can do not only for mom, but for baby as well. So nutrient support is a huge number one piece. Um, but I also think it's really important to address the mental emotional aspect here. I think what's so common is we are uh, racing to try and get pregnant and all we want to do is have a baby. And then we have this baby and all of a sudden we, we realize, I don't know who I am, right? Having a strong sense of self is so important when we are going into this journey and to help you into that next stage. So having a strong sense of self, understanding how we uh, have the ability to pivot, stay flexible. These are a lot of qualities. I know that there's um, quite a few, you know, working moms that were like, how am I going to make this all fit? How am I going to make this all work? And a lot of it is utilizing the skills you may have already in your practice, which is adaptability, flexibility, coming up with creative solutions. You might be used to that working with your teams, but how are you going to do that when there's baby and you need to figure out how to feed yourself and how to pick this thing up off the floor while you're holding something, you know, it's, there's a lot of adaptability and recognizing that there's not, there, there's not necessarily like a perfect way to do things. You and I were talking about before this and uh, yeah, just giving compassion to yourself, having that ability to have compassion as we go through these stages of, of going into stepping into motherhood. Ugh. That is so relevant and I feel that to my soul. I, uh, you reminded me, I did this exercise. It was kind of like a personal growth development exercise with a mentor. And he was saying, um, like, do these I am statements and we're going to get to the core of who you are as a person. And of course, I started out like, I am a mom. I am a wife. I am a doctor. And he was like, isn't it interesting that you are putting your entire identity on the ways that you serve others? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, gosh, I didn't ever yeah. think about that. But we really had to work to get to that sense of self and like, who am, am I aside from yes. all of these ways that I serve? externally. And that's some deep work, but it how is. are you able to sort those things out before it actually is very easy for you to make, you know, motherhood or whatever your entire identity? Absolutely. And and I see this too, right? You know, with the postpartum phase, it's like we're so focused on baby that we lose sight of who we are. And so it's really important that we're setting up those uh, just things that make us feel like us. And even just the ability to like ask and receive help, the ability to build a healthy relationship, you know, body image, we didn't even talk about how can I support a more healthy relationship towards my body image? Cause you have to really surrender to that during pregnancy and in the postpartum stages. And then the last piece also is um, if there's anyone, you know, listening that has a, a fear of eating more, when you are going through pregnancy, when you are, you know, breastfeeding, breastfeeding, our caloric needs increase by 500 to close to 700 calories a day. And so if we, we view calories as a bad thing or a fear of food, it can really put not only our own mental emotional state, you know, at risk, but also our ability to produce milk or to support baby, or again, from all of those aspects. So there's a lot of internal work that we can do beforehand that sets us up for success in the future, long beyond too. I think surrender is the right word that it you is. use. Mm -hmm. That was my theme of the of life for a, a few years is is surrender, and it's really hard, especially if you're programmed to be the one in control and to be a decision maker, and it's very hard to release some of that. So, do you have some advice if someone's listening and they're like, "Gosh." I didn't realize maybe I, maybe I need to work on some of these things. What type of support team should we assemble to help us to navigate some of these concerns? Absolutely. I think to, to your point, having a support team where it's not just one person, right? I'm working with a functional practitioner, but I'm also working with someone on my mental, emotional state. And that's where bringing in 
you know, you might work with a therapist, but a therapist may only do talk therapy with you. And maybe that works in a certain aspect of your journey, but it's not really helping get deeper. So I really like for this, for a certain type of person, um, somatic work. So soma means body helping you get into the body. So psychologically, we can make sense that why am I worrying about this? I know it's not something I need to worry about, but whatever is coming up for me, I'm, I'm feeling flutters in my chest. I'm feeling, you know, sweaty. I feel like I can't get this jitteriness out of my body. It's trying to start to go inward. And that's where even you know, looking at uh, internal family systems and some different um, therapeutic modalities. But I, I really do often recommend, because of course that's not my scope. So I refer out for that. And when we can work on both the mental emotional space alongside the physical, it's just, that's that's where the magic happens. It, it truly is. So I would say, you know, the first aspect, if you can't necessarily hire a, a therapist or a somatics practitioner, it might be going to a sound bath. It might be going to a yoga class, but finding the yoga class that's a little bit more restorative and maybe the teacher that is, you know, uh, infusing words of positivity and and words of surrender and, and aspects like that. Um, sometimes I think it's also, you know, helping to expose yourself to those different ideas. You mentioned a couple of books that you're reading, you know, Jay Shetty is amazing with this, you know, think like a monk, he's truly helping you. A lot of that is just slowing down, getting connected to ourselves. So those are a few ways. And that's also why I love walking and being in nature, because nature is a natural reset for, for the nervous system. So the more that we can tap into our nervous system, that's really when <laughs> the body is able to, to turn back online. Right. Speaking of how we engage with stressors and kind of transform stress, I know that you love talking about cortisol and our adrenal health, and all of that is very relevant to the preconception planning timeframe. And I was hoping you could share with us a little bit about um, when you're when you're working with patients, how does that come into the story? Are you, uh, how are you screening for HPA axis or adrenal dysfunction and and incorporating that into someone's preconception plan? Absolutely. I mean, so first, when we're assessing someone and we're looking at symptoms, some things that are going to be a red flag for me are one issues with sleep, difficulty falling asleep, waking up and feeling anxious, I'm not able to stay asleep feeling unrefreshed upon waking, but it could also be during the day. I'm worrying all the time. I am feeling tired, but wired. I am feeling exhausted and burned out. Um, there's, you know, four aspects, and this is different than cortisol, but four aspects of a trauma response and there's fight, flight, freeze. But I think we often forget about the fourth, which is fawn. Fawn is more of like our codependent uh, nature, our people pleasing. And sometimes fawn can feel you know, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted because I'm, I'm people pleasing all day long. So there's kind of that aspect to it. But when we're looking at cortisol, um, cortisol is our main stress hormone. And so if those red flags are coming up, I'm saying, you know what, let's run a, uh, a cortisol test to really see where might we need to pinpoint to support. Um, and I, I'm usually looking at this, right, in cases of PCOS, in cases of HA, hypothalamic amenorrhea, cases of very low hormone, honestly, it really does all come back to stress for me. That's a big component of this work. So any stressor that's coming in through the brain, it's then sending a message to either rest and digest. Is this a time that we are you know, able to be fertile and sit down and either go to the bathroom or sit down and go and make a baby? Or is this a time that I need to run? And so that's kind of the conversation that I have with clients. And that's when I say, you know what, let's actually look at your cortisol. Um, and so what we could do is I recommend a four point test in some cases, even a five point test. My favorite laboratory uh, that I use is Dutch. Um, very, I love them, highly recommend. And so we look at, you know, when we take in the light and dark cycle and so light comes in through our eyes, it goes through the retina and there's a light sensing protein called melanopsin and that assesses is it time to be awake or is it time to wind down? So more of that blue hue, that bright color, right from the sun, but also we get it from our phones and our screens. That's gonna tell us cortisol should come up. And when we see more of an amber light, think about sunsets, campfires, but you might also have like a red light at your home that could, um, or that does tell that, that melanopsin light sensing protein, it's time to wind down. And so what we would want to see in a cortisol rhythm known as circadian rhythm, and this impacts, again, every organ, every gland, there are clock genes, there are these little uh, sensing proteins in every area of the body, right? Every, every organ and gland runs on a rhythm. And so what we would typically want to see with cortisol is that uh, when we wake up, 
cortisol is at the highest, right? Following the sun, we have the steepest rise. We call it our cortisol awakening response. And then it drops down in the afternoon. It's lowest at night. And that's when melatonin turns on. Now that's what we want to see. It's very rare that I do see that for a patient initially coming in. Someone might have cortisol very, very low in the morning and it's high when they should be going to bed. You know, we would call that a flip-flop pattern. We might see someone who's really feeling burned out. They can't get out of bed. They're completely exhausted. Cortisol might be very flatlined, right? We might not have a, have a rhythm at all. So when we can look at cortisol, it can help us to assess where to pinpoint, not only from a lifestyle aspect, um, it can impact blood sugars, of course, right? Because uh, glucose and cortisol follow the same rhythm. Um, glucose is a gluco or cortisol is a glucocorticoid. Um, but then we're also looking at, you know, different targeted supplementation adaptogens that can help the body to really balance out what that natural circadian rhythm looks like. And, and this does impact our fertility. It impacts our ability trying to conceive, you know, how, um, the messages that are being sent from the brain to LH and FSH that's run on a circadian rhythm. So a lot of this really can come back to the adrenal conversation when we're looking at the trying to conceive journey. That was such a good answer. And I'm so glad that you described the different patterns that we might see when we do cortisol testing, because sometimes patients will ask me like, well, you know, I'm stressed. Can't we just kind of guess? I mean, you know, I already know that I'm stressed, but we don't know is cortisol super low in the morning when we would expect it to be high? Is it super high at night? So when we do the testing, it adds a layer of specificity so that we know, like you said, how to adjust the lifestyle, how to tailor our targeted treatment plan. Sometimes when I'm working with patients, it it's these recommendations that seem so simple that it's easy to take for granted. Like I'll say, I want you in bed before 11 p.m. in a room that's so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, that's so simple. But it's for this very reason, because our, especially in this case, our reproductive hormones are secreted in that pulsatile manner that is dictated by our light and darkness cues. And you're right. It is simple to get in bed and turn all the lights off. So let's do it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes, honestly, a test, not only as a practitioner, it can help us be very targeted in our recommendations, but sometimes people need to see it to believe what they're actually feeling. And so sometimes I use it even as a motivation tactic. Okay. We see how poor we're functioning. Now let's really make sure we're getting things on board. Yeah. It's easier to change what we can measure. I'm, I'm that person. I really relate <laughs> to that. So I get it. Love data. <laughs> Love data. So, um, obviously the cortisol piece is important, but this um, circadian rhythm, I have a lot of patients in my practice who are nurses or maybe they're police officers or something where like the nature of their job is yeah. to have to have that pattern disrupted. What advice do you have to that population who is feeling like, ah, I can't, this is my lifestyle? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, thank you to shift workers. Thank you for the work you do. Like we need you. And I think, it's 25% of our population are shift workers. And so how can we support you on your reproductive, you know, conception journey? Um, it's back to, I use light and dark and that's the biggest piece, but then there can also be adaptogens that we use as well. So for someone that's the shift worker, we're looking at, and there's the shift worker, like the policeman, the uh, policewoman, the uh, nurse, but there's also the shift work lifestyle. So someone who's, you know, I have a musician and she works a nine to five job, but then on the weekends, she's up until two or 3 a.m., right? And so how can we really help the body get more into this resilient space? So blackout curtains, black everything out. I don't want to see anything on your alarm clock. I want the phone out of the room. Don't look at blue screens before you go to bed. Um, but but if we're looking at someone who's like a two night, two night, so two days on, two days off, that's what's going to put the most damper on you know, like really challenging the, that circadian system. So if possible, try and push, even if you can do a week on a week off or for days and night shift, that two and two can be really rough to transition. So if you are in that two and two, again, dark lights uh, or sorry, dark, um, blackout curtains. Uh, I also recommend the Amber glasses, the blue blocking glasses, because remember that Amber light is going to tell us it's time to wind things down. So when you get off your shift and it's really bright out, we're trying to tell the body, wind things down. Um, and then adaptogens. Um, I really, really recommend adaptogens for the shift work lifestyle and the shift workers out there. Um, so looking at things like ashwagandha, holy basil, 
uh, passion flower, lemon balm. There can be some different herbs as well. So I, I really recommend utilizing those uh, to help with the transition. We've got tools. That's what we do is yeah. we figure yeah. out what's your lifestyle and how can we maximize and we'll, we'll make it work. And there are so many tools in, in these toolboxes. And I want to bring us back to nutrition for a moment because I think you've made such a strong case for why it's important to focus on good nutrition preconception during pregnancy. But for many of us, we get pregnant, we have food aversions, we have cravings. I remember feeling so guilty when I was pregnant with my first daughter because I just couldn't keep anything down or nothing sounded good. Uh, what advice do you have for those of us who really have a goal of honoring good nutrition, but we're not feeling so hot during pregnancy? <laughs> yes. I mean, that's, that's the thing, right? There's a reality here and we can read all the books and pre prepare all we want, but the body is going to do what it's going to do. And so again, that's where the surrender sometimes and meeting us where we're at. And again, that's where I try to say, you know, first trimester, that's usually when we're experiencing the most nausea and aversions, usually into the second trimester, things get a little bit better. Um, my biggest piece of advice is letting go the uh, the wanting it to be perfect. It's it's not going to be perfect, and that's okay. And there can still be creative solutions, right? I remember that I was uh, on a grilled cheese kick, and it's like, okay, well, can I sneak in some tomato or a little spinach, or can I do a green juice, or are there some creative ways that we can bring in some antioxidants? But I also try to remind people that you know, you're not doing something wrong um, and don't feel guilty about it. You know, give yourself some grace because this is, this is hard and it will, for most people, it will pass for others. I have a, a mama right now. And I mean, she's, she's one of those of the, you know, rare population that continue with hyperemesis. So um, we just have to address that through different strategies. But I think again, give yourself grace and be okay if you're the type of person that's used to eating a certain way or being really perfect or you're someone who tracks all your macros, you might have a sandwich and you haven't had a sandwich in years. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I I joke that there was a time during my first pregnancy where um, the only thing that even sounded remotely appetizing to me was Raisin Bran like a raisin bran type cereal, you know, yep, but yep. I was eating and that's the thing that I could eat. And now I joke like, and now I have this beautiful nine-year-old and she turned out perfect. So you know what? It's okay if you can just eat raisin bran for a couple of weeks and that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And usually into the, the second trimester, we get our appetite back. Sometimes we're really concerned we're not eating enough. I try to say maximize your caloric intake, you know, in that second trimester, third trimester, Again, appetite might be really good, or you might start, you know, again, not having enough space anymore. And so we're kind of um, trying to find uh, different strategies for more concentrated nutrition, but give yourself grace and compassion and give yourself permission. I think permission is another big word here. Mm -hmm. That's probably good advice for the entirety of motherhood mm -hmm. <laughs> anywhere along 100%. that spectrum. So for our, for our postpartum listeners, I have another another question that came through that I wanted to to get your way. This question is, how do I know if my postpartum fatigue is normal due to, you know, lack of sleep and breastfeeding and all of those things? Oh, or is there something more going on here? And should I get some labs? Should I look into this? What's your what's your hot take? Yeah, yeah. Well, First off, uh, since we were talking about shift work, you're basically moving into a shift work lifestyle, right? In those first um, months postpartum. So being mindful, okay, I, can I keep it as dark as possible? Can I do certain things to support? I really like doing a happy light in the morning to help with the awakening response, get a nap, you know, in 20, 30 minutes to try to relieve some of the sleep debt that you're having. Um, but I do always recommend for uh, new moms to get Labs done two to three months postpartum, really, really important since so much can really shift with the drastic change of hormones. So, you know, looking at typically uh, your PCP should be running maybe a TSH, but I like to do a full panel, a full thyroid panel because thyroid could really swing. Um, iron, iron is oftenly, often depleted during pregnancy. So running an iron, a ferritin, a TIBC, uh, vitamin D can be really helpful and impactful with energy levels as well. So those would be kind of the top ones that I'm that I'm looking at. But with energy and fatigue, you're also need to assess, you know, am I adequately hydrating? Do I have enough electrolytes? Am I eating enough? It's really easy to just forget about ourselves. And so making sure also that we have 
um, certain just checks and balances in um, at home. Maybe it's our partner that can really help to ensure that we're supporting us in that fourth trimester, right? Nourishment, rest, and rejuvenation. I love it. Yeah, let's do some labs, and I'll just speak to this. You know, when you're when you're breastfeeding, you already mentioned that sometimes you need 300, 500 calories more a day. And if you're not used to that, it's easy to under eat when you're nursing all day long. And that I certainly found that to be true because you just get distracted. Like maybe you're even just staring into your baby's eyes for hours and you just forget. Yes. Yes. I think I, I literally burnt toast three times yesterday because because you keep getting distracted. And so again, coming up with creative solutions, um, and that might be concentrated calories, it might be, you know, pouches, or uh, adding more oils and adding more fats, doing nut butters, doing things that are a bit more concentrated of calories, because every bite counts. <laughs> mm, every bite counts. Um, this is another reason why it's just so good to have that support team that we talked about, like, who's going to bring you snacks? And who's going to bring you the avocado and the nut butters and all of these things to help keep you nourished. It's so important. It is. It is. I mean, we, the, one of my favorite books is a uh, hunt gather parent. I highly recommend it. Um, even if you're, you know, still playing, you know, trying to conceive right now, because it's really helping to remind us about, we were meant to grow up and be raised in villages and to help the other villagers, right. To help during that postpartum phase, but also beyond, right. How can we grow up in a nurturing environment where the community members support each other. And so that's something to just really be thinking about, like what what does my community look like in person, but also virtually. And I think that's the beauty of social media is that, you know, that the outpouring of other mamas, you know, reaching out. I, I heard from women that I haven't heard from in years, just sharing their own journey. And a lot of that as moms, whether you're going through trying to conceive, whether you're currently pregnant, postpartum, it's validation with other moms that, hey, you're not going to always get it right, but it's okay. Me too. You're not alone. You can do this. You got this. Having the encouragement, right? And and I think, again, that's where community comes into play, virtually and in person. Hmm. If anybody was listening and needed this message, I hope that that just went right to your heart and you're feeling so encouraged by us right now on this show because we totally understand I always, as we come to the end of our episode, I love to ask some fun questions. You've yeah. kind of answered one of the fun questions that I wanted to ask, but um, we have a shared love for fertility. Well, I would say not just fertility, but like self-improvement reading, self-development, but fertility too. You've mentioned some books that you love already, but will you tell us maybe a few more fertility centric faves that are on your bookshelf right now? Yes, absolutely. So this kind of depends on maybe what phase that you're in, what books would be supportive. Um, but I always like to refer out if you can read, listen and see something in multiple, multiple different formats, it can really help to drive home something that you're trying to learn and um, integrate into your life. So if you're for the topic of coming off birth control, uh, go to Dr. Jolene Brighton, her book, um, coming off birth control highly recommend her books. Um, uh, the period repair manual, um, yeah. highly, highly recommend. That's always, I call it like the female Bible, uh, taking charge of your fertility by Tony Weschler. That's awesome. also a Bible. I tell people pick this up yeah. while we're working together so that you can, again, get educated on all the nitty gritty pieces that you want to learn before trying to conceive. And then if you're, again, you know, maybe you just found out you're pregnant. What can I do? What are some things that, you know, we start going down that path um, my favorite that I first started out with was Expecting Better by Emily Oster. And that really helped to break down some of the myths around what should I or shouldn't I do. A lot of the recommendations you're getting from your OB or your midwife might be very vague. And so looking at the data and, and looking at the science that um, Emily Oster puts out, it was really, really helpful for me when I first found out I was pregnant. And then during those phases um, of the different trimesters, talking about mindset, um, a Mindful Pregnancy, I highly recommend that book. It's uh, by the makers of Headspace, the, the app that looks oh. at meditation. Love that, highly recommend. Um, and then as you get further into the third trimester, you're really preparing for labor, for birth, but you're also, you know, I would, I very much stress the importance of preparing for the fourth trimester. So the book, The Fourth Trimester, um, understanding more about birth. So Ina May, uh, Ina May Gaskin, uh, Guide to Childbirth, um, birthing from within, just being aware of different, there's all formats 
of birth and what that can look like. And I think just being open to lots of different scenarios that may happen. Um, and then, yeah, the postpartum phase, it's that moves into the next aspect of not only mindset and, you know, how things are pivoting and changing. Um, but I do, I do like the book, the fourth trimester um, is a really good space of just encouraging nourishment, rejuvenation, and what those, you know, first three to four months look like. All right, everyone get those on your library app or in your Amazon card or whatever you need to do. Those are such good recommendations. Well, I want to um, send my gratitude to our listeners for joining us for this episode. It's such an honor to be a trusted source of information. Much gratitude to our show's producer, Paola Martini. And Kristen, so much gratitude your way for sharing your personal experience and your insights with us. It's just been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. (laughs) See you next time, everyone. Did you love this episode and want to hear more? Head over to drkaliawaddles.com slash podcast where you can find more episodes on all things fertility.